I think uh, in a way he created such a caricature of his own position and its implication that he was not a great danger in uh, changing us in a way that could not be acceptable. On the contrary, I think Norway become a better society after the atrocities. And I will try to explain the mechanisms behind that thing or occurrences. Okay? Then I start. <laughs> As uh, you know, it was two years ago. It was in the afternoon of July 22nd, still summer. I was packing some luggage. Uh, we should move down from a place we rented in the mountains. And I had to cry out to my wife who locked the door that you must come immediately to the radio. Something seems to be, something awful seems to have uh, happened. And it was so, it was one of the, a really huge building in the center of Oslo. And it was the building with the prime minister's office at the top, and then all the way down. The building didn't collapse completely. They are still um, trying to bring it in shape, and all traffic is directed around <coughs> the whole place. But um, uh, it looked as a sort of war had hit Oslo center. It can nearly not be described how bad it looked the uh, days after. And eight people were immediately killed. More were in hospital, badly hurt. The uh, office for the Minister of Justice was badly hurt. The offender in his car filled to the brim with explosives had been delayed in the traffic. Therefore, the explosion occurred an hour after ordinary office hours. If in time, hundreds of uh, the ministerial people would have been killed or badly uh, hurt. And of course, with such an occurrence, the first answer uh, or the first question raised, who is this, what happened? Who was it? Who uh, were behind it? And uh, as most people sitting here in the car towards Oslo, I thought, uh, oh my, it must have been some Arab uh, revenge for the caricatures or for our participation in Afghanistan war and uh, general uh, bad uh, acts seen from their point of view. And if so, if this was a Muslim attack, it would be a bad period of time in Norway. But then, uh, as the night drew on, and we were continuously listening, <laughs> other alarming news dripped in. There were shootings at a summer camp for political active youngsters, mostly from the ruling uh, Socialist Party of Norway. It took place on a tiny island in an inland lake, an hour's drive from Oslo. A tall man walking back and forth, systematically killing everyone he could find. Some as young as 14, without mercy, just killing any youth he saw. He saw many. 69 were murdered there. All in all, he killed 77 Porsche Persians. And of course, damaged a lot of other bodies, even if they didn't die. The horror, despair, and sorrow that spread in the country, that needs an artist's hand to describe, and I refrain from any attempt. But uh, point to one piece of news that brought some sort of relief during the long night. The offender was not an immigrant. He was a very Norwegian Norwegian. And uh, soon it became clear 
this was the same man who had exploded the governmental building. One man, so much damage, of the symbolic centers of the country. That was very important. So uh, then, uh, for me, very much interested in restorative justice. Uh, one of the first thanks, uh, thoughts was, uh, um, can restoration be possible after such occurrences? Those killed will never be back, except in dreams and memories. And for those close to the killed ones, their opinion might be that the killer ought to burn in hell forever. So what is then left to restore? I think the social system is left to restore. And that is the essence in how I see it. And it got a good start, I would say. Um, some elements in what can be seen as a restorative process commenced immediately. Soon after the bomb exploded, the prime minister was on radio. And he kept there for most of the night until he was also exchanged with television, where he also was. And his statements were those of sorrow, <coughs> despair, solidarity with the victims, but also very central in his messages that night. That was that we will not meet these acts with vengeance and terror, but by preserving our ideals for a democratic society. On the third day <coughs> after the atrocities, a memorial meeting was held outside the city, of Os city hall of Oslo. The town has some 600,000 inhabitants, and estimates suggested that 150,000 of us were there. The crown, crown prince spoke, or maybe the king. I'm kind of mixed it up. The prime minister spoke, survivors spoke. And I didn't hear one sentence on vengeance, not one. Instead, as formulated by one of the survivors, let us answer with roses. Or from another of the young survivors, if one man can expose so much hatred, imagine then how much love we can express together. Very beautiful uh, formulated, I think. The mayor of Oslo put it like this in an interview. Together we will punish the killer. Our punishment will be more openness, more tolerance, more democracy. Some weeks after the massacre, we had a municipal election in the country and the mayor was re-elected with an extraordinary large margin. Only roses then in words and reality. Nearly everyone had roses in hand and left them later on several memorial points in the town. A procession from the city hall to the central church was planned but canceled. There were too many people everywhere were there. Similar memorial ceremonies took place all over the country in the days that followed. Import tax on roses was temporarily <laughs> removed. The public transportation system in Oslo had to be redirected not to destroy the monuments of flowers in uh, the center of the town. And this is then related to your question. In a way, we come closer to each other during these day, days. The politicians were an important part of this. I got really respect vis-a-vis uh, -vis the way they uh, handled it. And uh, they were, uh, reacting correct, and they were a driving force in the whole thing. And I think uh, our prime minister, he's still there. He will maybe lose in September. He uh, was very good in putting words 
to the feelings. Here was nothing of the political rhetoric of Bush after September 11th or Cameron after the youth riots in British towns. And um, the political leaders of Norway agreed not to attack each other for a period. And that was remarkable. We were to have a local election uh, soon afterwards. So uh, it was uh, very grave, but also a very uh, pleasant feelings exposed all the time. It was a sort of feeling of community. I am so old that I have lived when uh, Germany uh, surrendered and uh, uh, left uh, Norway after occupation in 1945. That was some of the same feelings in the atmosphere uh, in Norway just now. And sort of United Nation for a period. Terrible days then, but with some hope. In an article with Hedda Jarsen two days after the atrocities, and uh, since you emphasized to predict, I'm a bit proud of that, that we two days after used the title, A Better Norway is growing out of this. That was our strong feeling. It was published in Denmark. The horror drove us to the streets, and there pulled us together. <laughs> What were we gathering around? First of all, the victims, of course. Innocent youngsters had been together on that island to gain knowledge on how to preserve and improve our country, killed without mercy. And then the system itself, we were all threatened. Basic values and perceptions of us as a nation had been uh, under attack, the killer had challenged element in our central value system. International comparative studies show Norwegian to be at the very top, top in trusting each other and close to the bottom in killing each other, and then these atrocities. So we were to some extent converted to one big arena of restoration. We think usually of restoration as a process going on between a limited number of participants, the victim, the offender, the mediator. That's the prototype. But to us, in the days following July 22nd, the whole nation got involved. The shock and sorrow was so great that new forms had to be created. Emotions were displayed, values clarified, norms strengthened. To a large extent, I think the surviving youth from the island were a driving force in all that which is quite remarkable. No experts in between, no uh, experts on how to communicate with the population. It came raw from the kids. <coughs> Roses rather than hatred were these first days a gift to us from the surviving youth. But it was a penal court it should end in. And they lasted 10 weeks. No other solutions would have been possible. Even as an ardent believer in restorative justice or in an alternative uh, board for handling as conflicts as I like to call these. I don't like to call them committees for restorative justice. I like to call them meeting places for clearing up in conflicts. There are so many things that can't be restored. So I think that is more honest. But I don't think it would have been a feasible alternative to handle a case like this outside the structure of penal law. First, the atrocities of July were not the case between a wrongdoer and a limited number of people. It was a whole nation involved. It was a case of one person against most of society. We couldn't all be there in a room for restoration, for example. A suitable forum had to be found. And that forum, and that's so important, had to be an extremely open forum because it was a case for us all, this 
horror we had been through. Most meetings of restorative justice takes place in closed rooms without media attention. That is most often a necessity to assure free talk in uh, that form of handling of conflicts. A penal court has to operate according to the opposite principle in an open society. And the court, Oslo Tingret, it is called, lived up to that expectation. Before the proceedings commenced, a 29-page document was distributed. Here the principle and plans for the proceedings were outlined. All together, some 2,500 persons would have the right to attend the case. They'd been victims or close to the victims, and therefore uh, had that right. But also the media, of course, and 700 journalists from 200 different media companies from all over the world had asked for accreditation to be there to report from the case. The interior of the courthouse in the center of Oslo was rearranged. The major courtroom could uh, now give space to close to 200 persons. It was planned for daily attendance of some 100 per persons close to the deceased and 90 journalists. Others with the right to attend and the remaining media had seven other courtrooms to the disposal in the building and also uh, rooms in a nearby, nearby hotel. And I uh, emphasize this because if you want a sort of participatory process, it is of course necessary to use the media and the possibilities they create to the utmost. We live in a changed society and it's so important that these bodies take care of this. All these rooms were provided with large TV screens transmitting all that occurred in the major courtroom. In addition, 17 courts spread all over Norway, from the south to the very, very tip up in the north. Um, they were provided with the same equipment for those with the right to attend. Not, not everybody could come in from the street. You, must, you had to, in a way, document you had some good reason for being there. But our national broadcasting company presented, almost, uh, presented also most of what happened, in addition to numerous interviews and comments. Um, an, ad an added reason for not being able to solve this in the form of some conflict handling was that the offender did not accept that he had an, done anything wrong. He claimed, and he continues to claim that, that uh, it was right what he did, and he do not regret his acts. He stubbornly sees himself as a heroic soldier who had to do what he did. He looked at himself as a martyr. He was engaged in a holy war, a savior of the country and of Christianity from the invasions of Muslims and also what has received considerably less attention. It was also to rescue us from uh, cultural Marxism and feminism. He has spread a manuscript of more than 1,500 pages with that message. He killed to rescue Norway. And uh, Norway isn't yet rescued, according to his standards. So he fought a one-man war from the extreme right. He regrets nothing. No, he was demobilized. He couldn't be trusted outside. He was and is an anxious man. In addition, if we have tried to apply a civil <laughs> procedure around it all, uh, he would probably soon have been killed by someone if he was not protected by wolves. But then, uh, as it all developed, vital restorative ideals were cared for during the proceedings. The court became an arena for creating national understanding of what had happened. A very efficient arena due to the exceptionally well-organized communication system from the courtroom. 
The victims have been met with quite exceptional attention. The most uh, moving example took place in a week, uh, two weeks, uh, one week with those badly wounded who gave their uh, witness uh, statements, and then one week with the killed ones, where the forensic psychiatrist described how they had been killed and what had happened to their bodies, and where it was uh, held uh, memory talks for them. In the court, um, connected to each case, a large picture of the killed victim was exposed. And all this also out on television to the general population. I'm not quite sure if all of it. Something was evaluated as so uh, hard uh, to survive, to see that it might have been some censorship here. After a week with the death, uh, then, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, came also uh, a week with the survivors, some of them, many of them, with very clear uh, signs of how badly they had been hurt. The sort of chief in the, or next to the chief in the Ministry for Prison Affairs, he was very close to blind when he gave his witness, and I think he has not improved. Never ever in modern time have so many victims been given so much attention in the Norwegian court. In addition came that the relatives of the killed, as well as all survivors who wanted, were supported with one or several lawyers, a sort of assistant attorney. Uh, you had a word for it, uh, Jan, on what you call them in English. They are there, they are lawyers, they are there close to the victims. Party in French. Uh, what? The, the civil party. The civil party, okay. Um, there were, who's, with us, they were all lawyers, more than 170 such assistant, assistant attorneys were engaged in the case. They create some principal problems, of course, that we have to face. They create the problems regarding to the balance of power in the courtroom, because they will, to a large extent, ally with prosecution. So the uh, offender had uh, a little uh, group of um, uh, defenders, two or three, but then uh, the prosecutors had uh, close to 200 against this other little group. It didn't matter so much in this case since he had accepted what he had done. But it is a, uh, it is a problem in the long run with this element in the courts. And I have not seen it very severely uh, discussed. Um, in the court, the killer was mostly met with courtesy. He did wear ordinary civil clothes, his handcuffs were removed. He showed a sort of Nazi greeting while entering the courtroom in the first few days, but abandoned the practice until leaving the court on the very last day. The prosecutor shook hand with him, and he was examined without pronounced aggression. In a one-hour monologue, he was allowed to explain the political ideas behind his acts. He was interrupted one or two times by the leading judge, but that was not to stop him, but to clarify points he presented. So the atmosphere in the court has been quite serious, often desperately sad, a sort of funeral day after day, with one exception. A man cried out, go to hell, your killer of my brother. Then he threw one of his shoes in the direction of the killer. It was a symbolic act of denigration. He was from Iraq. The shoe hit one of the defenders. Several in the room applauded. Better block away, 
I think it was the same day or the day before, some 40,000 people had assembled on a huge square facing <coughs> the building of our Labour Party on the initiative of some youngsters on Facebook. And together they sang Children of the Rainbow, a song the killer had said he hated. So far, so good, also in a restorative perspective. But it is a penal court this takes place in. It's a court to decide three elements. Is he guilty? If guilty, is he fit for punishment? If fit for punishment, what's the suitable amount of pain he ought to receive? As to guilt, as I mentioned, he admits the killings, but doesn't see himself as guilty. He sees himself as a commander in a holy war. A Christian soldier in war. So here the court had seemingly an easy task, guilty. But then comes the next question in our Western systems. Maybe this man is not an ordinary man. Maybe he's insane and can't be punished. To find out, experts on insanity were brought in already before the court case started. Two persons, two forensic psychiatrists, had investigated the mind of the killer. They declared him insane. Schizophrenic paranoia. A simple way to make him different from most of us. And now something exceptional happened because the media showed civil disobedience. Such reports are supposed to be kept secret, sort of inside information, uh, partly of that, and partly it should go on in the court. But the newspapers printed large part of the report. And uh, it turned out that the psychiatrist in addition to talks and tests to a large extent, had based their diagnosis on his acts, the atrocities, without considering the political framework of it all. They thought he acted so strange, or oh, he must be, be mad. Um, the diagnosis raised a folk storm in my otherwise peaceful country. The, Diagnose the victims, survivors, and persons who had lost someone thought through his acts, they asked for new forensic observation. Prosecution protested because this is never done, but the court accepted. A new pair of observers were called in. They declared him sane. So it was, in a way, a baroque situation. The two pairs of forensic psychiatrists have, through the 10 weeks of proceedings, been seated side by side on the first row in the courtroom, facing the offender. I don't think they faced each other very much. The one pair seeing a man they had placed outside normality, and therefore bound for a mental hospital. The other pair facing a person they see as peculiar but not more than is fit to answer for his responsibilities and being punished. But of course, and I wrote an article uh, on this in the Norwegian media towards, uh, nearly towards the end of the proceedings, it was a blessing that we got two sets of experts to explain what had happened. Because that gave the court, that gave the judges, the possibilities to function as ordinary judges. They got a chance, they got an intake to evaluate what was the sensible conclusion here. They were not captured by, yes, he's mad, but they were the two sets of psychiatrists forced each other to reveal what were the basis of their diagnosis. And a very, very good 
judge, yeah, the older judges in the panel were also good, but she was exceptional. She created during the writing of the sentence an extremely good um, yeah, diagnosis of the diagnosis, an extremely good evaluation of the proofs and disproofs from the uh, from the man from, uh, on him. And uh, I lost my way here now. Um, they, in a way, the judges were not as they so often are in expert, when experts overwhelm the court. They were not only secretaries for the experts and voices for them, they were really digging into it and used the sort of legal uh, techniques of examination. And the court decided he was sane, to the great relief to many of us. Yeah, why was that so important? It was important because a diagnosis of insanity would have been a helpful way to externalize the offender convert him to a being different from most of us. He wasn't. He's a Norwegian, like me, same social class. For a time, I lived close to his neighborhood. <coughs> Why him? Where did he find his models and ideas? Or more threatening, is it something in being Norwegian that made this possible? We live in a culture preoccupied with material success and in a country quite recently engaged in several wars, when Norwegian pilots returned from Libya after what was supposed to be the successful bombing there, or Minister of Defense at the time, no, she's the Minister of Justice, she received the pilots with thanks for their accomplishment in bombing of Libya. The more we make the man behind July 22nd an evil, or a monster, which is so usually uh, so easy to use, or an insane. The less we are able to understand the roots we have in common with him, and also what we ought to change in the country if we want it restored to standards we can accept to live with. And a diagnosis of insanity would also have created another problem. Such a diagnosis hides the normality of killing. Relatively many are able to carry out the most awful of acts against other people, from electric shocks to torture to mass extermination. They're not mad. They're ordinary, placed in situation that makes these acts possible. It's not only a question of the banality of evil, but of understanding elements in how hell can be created as a matter of routine. Again, we must ask, what is it with us, and also the global political situation that makes such behavior possible? How can we improve on the system to make killing less attractive? The challenge is to create social circumstances that make us all able to see the human being also in the killer. The court sentenced him to 21 years in preventive detention with a minimum time of 10 years and with an additional clause that would enable the state to keep him in prison for an unlimited amount of five years periods if he still was considered dangerous. If not seen as dangerous, he will have to be released considerably earlier, maybe after some 15 to 20 years. Many, and particularly journalists from abroad, there were several hundred of them in the case, expressed surprise by what they found to be an extremely lenient sentence. But how could it have been more severe if you want to remain true to basic legal principles? Lady Justice is most often presented with a sword in one hand and a scale in the other. The amount of punishment has to be balanced against the amount of evil acts committed, not too much, not too little. But what to do when the evil acts become overwhelmingly terrible? How can we then create a balance? 
How could the man who committed these atrocities ever pay back what he has done? Pay back in personal suffering? The man behind these killings belonged to the first division of evildoers in modern Western history. Eichmann killed millions, but stood in some way more distant from the concrete acts. Did it out of his office, an administrator of extermination. The man in Norway made and detonated the bomb himself. He then shot the teenagers on the island, moving around slowly, systematically killing everyone he saw. He spared some small children. As he saw it, they were not dangerous. They hadn't been indoctrinated yet to accept Muslims to the country. A punishment balancing the act of the Norwegian killer is out of question. What he has done can never be paid back on him. Altogether, he killed 77. Should he then be brought to the gallows 76 times without hanging him? But let that happen on transport 77. A catastrophe had occurred, one that can only be met by adhering to basic values of Norwegian society. Atrocities can never be balanced with the production of similar amount of pain. We cannot answer atrocities with equal to equal. It has to be something less. And to find standards for this more limited answer, we must ask, must ask for help in old-fashioned um, values of Norwegian societies. Values of forgiveness and grace. But to mobilize elements of this, one condition is essential. We must come close enough to see him as more than a killer. We must be able to see him as a human being, simply as one of us. I wrote about this at an early stage in the whole process, and I have never got so much uh, very, very angry reactions as after that statement. But to me, it is important. It brings me to the core of what has been my personal as well as scientific interest throughout much of my life. The question about the conditions for and consequences of coming close to others. So close to life or art that it becomes possible to recognize elements of common humanity in all sorts of people. I believe that the more we are enabled to see each other as fellow human beings, the more we are controlled by that knowledge and by the whole sets of norm integrated in us, ingrained in us throughout life on how to behave towards people of all sorts, from babies to old folks. To see the other is to be captured in the web of norms that make us human. The closer we come to another person, the stronger stand the inhibition against handling that person in ways seen as unacceptable within the culture where we belong. To accomplish this, is to me the great challenge for most sorts of crime preventive work. I have some base in empirical studies for this statement. I've studied uh, Norwegian killers in concentration camp in the north of Norway and compared their view on those they killed on the Yugoslavian prisoners with the views among the other two groups, those who killed and those who did not kill. And it was so clear, and it put an imprint on me for whole my life. It was so clear how much closer the non-killer had come to the prisoners in their prison, miserable presentation of themselves, dirty, smelling, uh, completely lost in the situation. The killer himself wanted to be seen as something extraordinary. A commander in war, he wanted to wear, wear a policeman's uniform on his first day in court when he was formally imprisoned. That was, of course, not accepted. 
has been active as a bodybuilder, has also gone through surgery to look even more the perfect man. It's not particularly easy to see him as an ordinary human being, one of us, but it is necessary. The sentence fell on August 24, no appeals followed, and on September 7, the sentence was legally valid. Never has the word relief been used more often, was the headline in Aftenposten, the largest newspaper in the country. And their editorial, the day after the sentence had been legally valid, had the title, Clarification and Relief. And I think they really captured the opinion in the country. The mood of the population. I can even prove it. For years, there have been international studies of the existence of trust. We're back to that. Trust uh, in um, various countries. When given the choice on a 10-point scale between saying that one cannot be careful, skeptical enough in interaction with other people, to the other end of the scale, uh, where it stands, most people can be trusted. Norwegian trust each other more than inhabitants in most nations in these studies, and even more so in the months just after the atrocities. I thought that was so interesting, a result. Now we are back to normal, but still at the top, interesting other. I think this has to do with that we live in a welfare state. We are not so many, five millions, and we have not yet created large internal class differences. We are able to see each other across all divisions that exist in so many countries. And I think this element is so important when we talk about crime prevention. But I fear the future for my country. Money might be a killer of social cohesion, it's far from certain that our present oil lubricated affluence will become a blessing for Norway. We all get more affluent, but the top level to an extent that threaten our up to now relatively egalitarian society. For a conference on crime prevention as this, I think it is of the greatest importance to warn against a development towards life forms where we lose each other as members of the same society. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Niels. Uh, any questions, remarks? I have one, but... It's a great dose. Just uh, hold on for one second, please. Hey. Um, it, by coincidence, I was actually, during the attack and the trial, I was traveling Canada and USA, where I used to live a couple of years. Um, and what went through the people overseas was, which is a, quite a different society to what happens in Norway is some mix of disbelief. How can they give him some showcase to, to place his messages? And somehow respect, like it, it hasn't been happening like that in, in any other country, not just overseas. Now, uh, what happens normally is there's, whenever something like this happens where the entire society feels threatened, whether it's a bombing at the marathon or a killing of right wing people to immigrants or whatever. It doesn't need to be that evil, like a president of a football team not paying his taxes, stuff like that. Um, then what happens is huge media pressure that influences um, people's opinion in terms of revenge and, and the, 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 the need for revenge for the society. Now, why, why didn't that happen in Norway? What, what, ha what was different just because you're nicer people and you have a crown prince and a king? Or 
What's difference? Why I, I was expecting some kind of pressure that especially media normally uh, pushes towards society. No, this was so terrible that uh, the political uh, establishment had nothing to gain in uh, saying uh, kill him, torture him. It was him against the rest, so he was not a sort no, he was captured, and it was nothing to, to win uh, politically, I think. But I would also add that I think that the prime minister and uh, those close to him also behaved in a very kind way. I, I lived also close to the prime minister once and I observed him as a school child. He was a kind boy and uh, he, he couldn't think of, there was no uh, other answer to this than to try to care for the victims. That was the only answer. The bishop of Oslo took part in funerals together with the priest of the Muslim community because some killed after that were Muslims. And it was a uniting effect this had. And this makes me so, uh, yeah, I'm of course a very conservative man, uh, wanting to preserve local communities to the extent that it is possible. To preserve the strength in people who feel they mean something to each other. And I think Norway, uh, to some extent, have been able to do that. We have some of the lowest prison figures in uh, the international statistics. Finland is a bit lower, but they have nearly no immigrants. And I think that explains uh, some of this, and they are not such a uh, useful target for um, groups from other countries selling drugs or, uh, or um, all that. Uh, so in general, I think the Scandinavian countries are relatively uh, consistently uh, welfare states in their minds. And that might uh, be behind it. I could in a parenthesis say that Finland was of course a part of Russia after the Second World War with regard to prisons and prison administration. Then they had paid prison figures as the Russian ones. But just after the war, they, it was important to get away from Stalin and get Scandinavian cooperation instead. And they dropped their prison figures down to the extreme low level. Uh, we had even more extreme than today. And nothing happened with crime, of course. There are so many other factors that influence what happens to those who misbehave. Well, there's, uh, there's one contradiction, at least in my head. Um, it's, I mean, it's, it sounds amazing how the, the Norwegian people deal with this, uh, with the aftermath of these atrocities. Uh, I don't see this coming in, in, in the German discussion at the moment, uh, talking about the National Socialistic Underground. But um, one thing is uh, contradictive, in my opinion. You had, I just looked it up, so I didn't know, but I... I knew you had a right-wing populist party in the national government. Yes. In 2009, 23%, um, 23% of the Norwegian voted for the Fortschrittsparty, Fortschrittspartei. Mm. They are openly, of course, like any right-wing populist parties, they are anti-Muslim, they create fear about uh, foreign infiltration, uh, they are xenophobe, they demand law and order, they are against multicultural and all that. We all know that. And 23%, it's the second biggest party in your national government. Mm. Uh, just two years before Breivik, they voted for this political concept in Norway. That's a little contradiction to me. But they had a problem, you see. Because politically, on all the matters, they were not so very far away from him. So it became, and we touched upon that earlier, uh, it became a, pro a point for some of the more right-wing political 
parties and also for individuals who were eagerly advocating uh, some of these ideas to cre create distance to Breivik. Mm. So it would have been a suicide attempt to in a way no, go, go like that, while particularly the youngsters behaved so fantastically. It was they who led the process in this uh, direction and created the sort of uh, community feelings that really brought us through it. Mm. So it's a double uh, thing here then, uh, but they have not changed uh, later on either. There is no, uh, but they, I think they will hesitate to uh, be seriously, uh, to say that he, he ought to get uh, less good uh, conditions in prison, decreased, uh, well, the welfare into the prison, because here it is a problem with him because he is very isolated in the prison and according to international agreements and also to other values, uh, prisoners should not be completely isolated, at least not for a long period. But he is not le let out to the other. So in compensation in a way, he get much better condition, material conditions in, I think he has two, maybe two, three cells to his disposal in the prison. Uh, to create this. There's another problem, worse, that I haven't mentioned and I will not go into it. That is, what do we do with a prisoner who wants to reach out to the media with his message later on? And usually, uh, I encourage that prisoners should, of course, tell about their destiny and tell about their conditions and uh, advocate. But here is a real serious uh, problem in how, how to face this, and we are discussing that uh, to some extent. Um, oh. yes, one more no. question. Yeah. Uh, what do you think will happen when he will be released? Will there be another discussion? Or will the unity, the unity still stand? Or will then people say, how can you release him? There will probably be much more opposition to a release of him, but uh, that will, it will not, I will not be alive at that time, but I have, as a, uh, to be sure, to be heard, uh, already stated that, of course, I will welcome him back to the streets of Norway if he has changed his views. If not, uh, he is to be considered a dangerous man and should, of course, not, uh, since we have a legal hand on him now, uh, we should not lose that grip. That would be uh, wrong. But if we could believe that he was another man, he had to go through the usual length of punishments and then be released, and it will be a lot of opposition to that. But, uh, yeah, full stop. Some more questions? Yes. Just a short question. Do you make any uh, changes in your legislation on firearms? <coughs> the on arms? Firearms. Legislation on firearms. Uh, firearms. Handguns. Uh, handguns. Uh, no, we have it. Uh, relatively strict uh, control. Not very, because Norway is also a country of farmers. And when the elk pass by, uh, it's <laughs> good to have the gun there. Uh, so uh, it isn't. But, uh, so actually, I think we have more guns in Norway than is normal in Europe, but we have nearly no killing. That's the point. We are, yeah, as you also mentioned for the United States, and we, we are one ten less than one-tenth. I think we are nearly only one in, uh, in 20. And the U.S. Uh, figures are so enormous, you know. So when they explode in, explode in killing sprees, there, if you can say that word, yeah. uh, then uh, it is also a continuation of their culture, not only access to guns. Yeah, now you've got uh, sort of, um, I feel it's difficult to describe this. Partly for me, it is emotionally, uh, as for nearly all Norwegians, it is emotionally difficult to think of it. And it's important to convey it and uh, it is difficult and uh, 
to know how it will be received if, if it can be understood. But my feelings, uh, it is very, was very good with your opening question, my feeling is that uh, uh, actually it was fine that uh, we were able to cope with it in this way. I cannot see any other ways that would have led to more cohesion, to led to more uh, stabilis uh, led to more strengthening of the social fabric in the country. And it is important to preserve the memory of this and maybe think of it as a value to be cared for when we work with these matters. And I thank you for your kind listening. Thank you. Very much.